now want to introduce our speaker this evening, Sarah Dykman. Uh, Sarah became the first person to follow by bicycle the eastern population of monarch butterflies on their round trip multinational, multi generational migration from Mexico to Canada and back. Her 10,201, 10,201 mile, we got to get that one in. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> 10,201 mile adventure on a beat up bicycle was a call to action. Sarah chronicled this journey in her new book, Bicycling with Butterflies. If you've not had a chance to read it, get your hands on it. Copies available at the library, get the bookstore, get there it is, right? One right there, right out the screen. Uh, but get your hands on it. Um, and then we're going to jump to your, um, and we got some at the library as well. Um, Sarah, uh, let's see here. We got this. Sarah divides her time between seasonal amphibian and reptile jobs, outdoor education, and adventures. She created beyondabook.org, write this down, beyondabook.org, to connect students to adventure in order to foster lifelong learners, boundary pushers, explorers, and stewards. Sarah, you've been very busy. <laughs> <laughs> And with Sometimes. that, <laughs> yeah, I just, just have to throw it out there. And with that, uh, I wanted to pass, uh, pass the floor to you, Sarah, now with your presentation, Bicycling with Butterflies. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invite. Uh, it, me it means a lot to me to do these presentations. I've, I've kind of coined my, my job or my, my purpose to be, to be a voice for the monarch. And so, if I'm just talking to a computer and no one's on the other side, it doesn't really work. So these these presentations mean a lot to me, and and I hope that everyone can can take what they learned tonight and then share it with a neighbor or share it around the dinner table, and then it kind of just ripples out. So I'm I'm really happy to to be here tonight, and I'm really happy to be supported by by the library. Libraries on a bike tour are just so important, like. There's been so many times where it's like either terrible weather, like maybe I have a horrible headwind or it's raining and you never get turned away from a library. They're, library, they're so democratic, they're so welcoming. I have sat for hours and hours at so many small town libraries, especially, and just been been welcomed and felt safe. And so I'm, I'm always really pleased to, to present for libraries and I'm happy that my book is in them now. It's pretty surreal. So I'll actually, what I'll do is um, share my screen and we'll get a little PowerPoint going here. So hopefully y'all can see a monarch. Um, the monarch is, is really the, the main character in my, in my book and in my story and, and tonight's presentation, honestly. Um, so what I want to do is do a little natural history, ecology, like basic overview of the monarch and then talk about bike touring and then share some stories. It, again, if you have questions, throw them in the chat. That's that's uh, probably the, the easiest way to kind of keep track of every, everything. But this is a, a monarch butterfly, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen monarchs. Um, I bet a lot of you have been seeing monarchs in your yards, rearing monarchs, um, gardening for monarchs. And I, I bet there's some folks here that might even, might even know more than me. I, I think the monarch has uh, a huge, huge support system and a huge team of people. And it's just such a pleasure to be part of it and to always be learning. So sorry if some of it's a little basic for you, but um, again, if you have deeper questions, throw them in the chat. So the, the kind of the basic ecology I wanna go over tonight is about their range. And this is a, a map of North America and you can kind of see it has three colors or four colors, excuse me, well, more than four, but um, there's four colors that represent where the monarchs spend their, their lives. And it's color coded by season. So the yellow is where monarchs spend their summer months. The green is where they spend the spring. Orange is where they spend the fall. And then the blue dots are where they spend the winter. And so you can see the summer range is huge and the winter range is really, really small. And that's, that's how we get this phenomenon where in the winter you'll see monarchs clustering in, in trees and overwintering in these really dense colonies. Um, and the main colony that, that is most often referred to when we're talking about the monarchs is in Michoacan and the state of Mexico here in Southern Mexico. And this is, well, I'll just throw on my, my slide. This is where I started my trip. The red line is my, my route. But I do wanna to call to attention that there are 
blue dots or there's blue in California and then there's some blue in Florida. The, the blue in Florida has this kind of like an interesting little side note that we could get to if someone's really interested. But for, for the most part, most of the monarchs overwinter in Mexico. And then this California population is kind of divided by the Rocky Mountains here. Now we say population, we say Eastern population and Western population, but they're actually the same population. We, we haven't seen any genetic um, differences between them. So it's, but, but for the, the sake of, of talking about them, we'll, I'll still refer to this as the Eastern monarchs. Oops, oops. Hello. the Eastern Monarchs and the Western Monarchs. And there's um, quite a bit of interesting things happening with the, with the Western Monarchs that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. And I'll get a little into that in a little bit here too. But I was mostly following the Eastern Monarchs. Like I said, I started in Michoacan and I went pretty much straight North. I stopped in my hometown in Kansas City, so that's where I'm from, before heading up into Canada. And then I went way over to the East Coast. I wanted to see New York City and Rhode Island. Like I, the, Rhode Island was the last state in the United States that I had yet to bike in. And like looking at this map now, I'm like, that was a long way out of the way for that. But I'm, I'm glad I did. The monarchs do go all the way to out East. And then I looped back North into Southern Ontario. And that was kind of a story on itself. Originally, I had just planned to go from New York straight back to my hometown in Kansas City. But people in Southern Ontario were like, there's so much cool stuff happening here. You've got to come, you've got to come. And so this, my, my detour to Southern uh, Ontario was probably my biggest detour, but you'll see on this map, there's lots of squiggles. And every single one of those squiggles was a result of an invitation of someone saying, oh, I'm a teacher, I'd love for you to present at my school, or oh, I have this amazing, there's this amazing garden or this farm and we're doing things differently here. And so I, I really did, for my route, try and say yes as much as possible. I had to say no sometimes just because I couldn't add hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. But if if time permitted it, I really did try and say yes because that's where the story was. Like I don't honestly remember all these miles, but I remember I remember the stops that are pretty much at every squiggle. I remember those are those are the stories that stick with me. And those are the stories I'll be telling to today. Um, but as far as monarch biology goes, I think the only other really important thing to know right off the bat is that the monarchs that I started with in Michoacan in March were not the same ones that I ended my trip with. So this is a multinational trip. It goes through three countries or migration, and it's also multi-generational. So it takes, depending on the weather, uh, depending on the weather, it takes between three to five generations to complete that loop. Okay, I apparently have really wanted to go to the slide, so we'll finally just go there. Um, this is this is a picture of, of me, obviously, on my bike, that the, the beater bike, the beat up bike. Um, the having a bike that's not like the most amazing, the most top of the line, lightest, fastest, prettiest bike was actually a, an important part of my my trip. Like, I think it's important to remind people that you don't need to go out and buy a bunch of gear to do an adventure. What you need is is to just go out and, and do it. And and so part of it was, hey, this is just an old beat up bike that I got and I, I made and cost a couple hundred dollars. The other thing is it's great theft deterrent. I could leave my bike in front of a grocery store and not, not really worry too much about it. And then you'll of course notice on my bike, I have these panniers. The front ones are, are store-bought and in those I carried things that I really, really wanted to make sure didn't get um, wet from rain. So I had my sleeping bag in the front, my sleeping pad, I had a computer, a camera, my journal, all that kind of stuff was in the front. And then in the back, in the back, the, the red bag is my tent. And then the blue thing on top is a, a little fold out chair. I, I gave presentations to kids along the way. And I always, two things that I love to do was, one was have the kids sit in my chair and be like, look, I brought a sofa on this trip. And they'd all be like, oh gosh, your jokes are lame. But the other thing I love to do is I'd take my, my, my tent and I'd set it up and then I'd see how many kids I could fit in the tent. And I think the record was like 16 kindergartners or something like that. But so I'd, I'd stick 16 kids in there. And then when they were all out, I'd say, okay, so my tent is basically a mansion because I can fit 16 people in it. And then I'd lift my tent up with just one finger and I'd say, and I could lift a, a mansion with one finger and then everyone would cheer. And it was, it was a gimmick 
but it always made me so happy. The doing the presentations was like the most important part of my trip. Like I kind of said in the beginning, being a voice for the monarch was the purpose of this trip was it was about being a voice for the monarch and using my bike kind of as a publicity stunt to start the conversations. So I'm also really good at kind of just going on tangents, forgive me, but that's, those are the, the back to the panniers. I also have the, my tools on the outside for, for roadside repairs. And then I also had a small stove. I'd usually carry about one day worth of food. And then I have like my rain gear and warm gear and stuff like that. So that was my bike setup. And there's like, so many amazing reasons to bike tour. I, I find it to be one of the best modes of transportation, especially of, of traveling. And there's a, a few reasons, but one is like you are self-contained and you like the, the amount of freedom you have is just, it, it's unrivaled. There's, there's no other trans, ma means of travel that gives you quite as much freedom. And so like, I honestly would just always just eat when I was hungry, that's how it went. And this is easier. I've done a lot of trips with friends and you're like, you know, there's a little more negotiating, but when I, this was a solo trip, so it was like, I'm hungry, I'll stop. Um, and then I would just get to also camp whenever I wanted. That route that I showed at the, at the beginning, that was very much being made up as I went along. So I knew like, I knew I wanted to go to my parents' house, but in between where I was and there was like a bit of a mystery. So I'd set out in the morning, kind of having a main idea of where I'd want to go. Maybe something would pull me one road or the other but because I knew that I had everything I needed to eat and because I had everything I needed to camp the freedom was just like the whole world was my oyster and so this was a very a very classic camping spot this is my tent there and that's the road this is in Texas and this is pretty much how I always camped I didn't pay to camp once on the trip and it was important to me to do this well one because like I, I can't afford to spend a night every night in a campground. And I also don't wanna have to plan every single night where I'm gonna be. Um, but also because it like, it gave me this incredible empathy for the monarch because the monarch also can't plan on camp spots, can't plan to be in a certain spot every night. The monarch is where the monarch is every day. And then they need a place to, to spend the night. And so I imagine there were nights for the monarch that were just like mine, where like maybe it was a stressful because stressful there wasn't a great spot or, or maybe they had to go further because there wasn't a great spot. Um, but then I also imagine that there's the nights where everything was perfect. Like they had exactly what they wanted and they were just like so so grateful to have, have their home. And, and that was the same for me. If I could find a flat spot that also had like a tree to keep my bike up, like propped up, that was like the more than I could ask for. So I, I really appreciate this way of camping. I should note that I am a white lady. So this, this, this way of camping is a privilege that I have. If someone did see me, their first reaction isn't going to be to call the police. Their first reaction is like, oh, that lady's probably traveling. Oh, maybe I should offer her a pizza. Um, and I think it's so important when we see people traveling to assume the best intentions because I have been given so much opportunity because people took took the time to ask about my trip and give me a chance. So another little tangent, but an important, a really important one. Um, now the, I've kind of talked about the freedom. Other great thing about bike touring like this, super easy to clean your tent, clean your house. Boom, boom. Um, my house is always clean when I bike tour. I just shake it out once a day. And then the other great thing about bike touring is the people you meet. And it's a cliche, but it is a cliche for a good reason. I do not remember the miles before or after this, I met this man. I, I, be, I mean, I do, I remember that it was like hot and boring and I was just like, kind of just trying to get through the day. It was just a long, a long stretch of, of road at hundred degree weather in Mexico. And I see this motorcycle in the distance that I like, as he's getting closer, I'm like noticing that the motorcycle is slowing down and like, of course, my first reaction is like, oh boy, what does this guy want? And then, and then I'm on a bike, I've got nowhere to go. So I'm like, well, I'm, I guess I'm going to find out. And he stops and he's like, hey, do you want some ice cream? And I was like, I do. <laughs> and again, I always tried to say yes to these invitations. This was an obvious easy one. I, I felt safe with him and uh, it's ice cream. I mean, what more could you want on a hot day? 
but th these are the moments I remember. And th this doesn't happen unless you're vulnerable, unless you're on the road, maybe walking to, maybe canoeing. But if you're in a car or a bus or a plane, these, these moments happen way less frequently. Um, now, it wasn't just roadside ice cream. Since I'm talking about ice cream, I should mention that I stayed with about 68 different families. Sometimes I met them at a grocery store on the road. Sometimes they heard about my trip and invited me um, to stay at their house. It, all, all sorts of different ways did I, did I meet up with, with folks. But um, this particular woman, her, her name's Margaret. She owned a dairy farm in Ontario. And she said, hey, do you want to come stay at my, my farm? And I was like, yes, of course. And then I love this photo because she is in this photo. She has, is feeding me homemade chocolate ice cream. Like, what more could you want? And, and then in the back, who is she feeding but, but the monarchs and other pollinators? And just how I felt like this bond to the monarchs as far as camping and finding a safe spot every night, I also felt the bond of finding food and getting, getting fed. Because it, those 68 people that took me in, almost all of them had some, some connection to the monarch and almost all of them had a garden in their in their yards or had a garden in at a park or a school or or wherever they could so just like I, me showing up to their house and getting fed the monarchs were showing up too and getting fed and so i i just i love that like in in ways that i didn't realize when i started my trip there were there were these connections about my traveling and the monarchs that were that were really linked now the best 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 reason to bike tour is you just find so many amazing creatures. If you are driving down the road, I guarantee you would not see this little, this little toadlet, cutest little guy in the world. But on a bike, you do, you do see them. You go a little bit, you go just fast enough that, that 10 miles doesn't feel like forever, but you're going slow enough that you can, you can see these creatures and then you can stop. So even something big, maybe you see a turtle on a, on a road, by the time you like decide to stop and then find a safe spot to pull over and then walk back, it's like, uh, actually, let's just keep going. But when you're on a bike, you're like, oh man, I would love to stop. So you like put your bike on the ground. I, the police showed up twice because people had called in a cyclist having crashed. But I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm just looking. Well, at that moment, it was caterpillars. But this moment it was frogs and, um, like I, we said in the introduction, I do, or I'm an amphibian biologist, and mostly in the summers, and frogs are, are my, one of my true passions, but they don't migrate like a monarch does. The monarch just was like the perfect creature to follow, but what I love is by following the monarchs, I was able to have all these incredible experiences with other creatures like, like this toad. Um, but of course, a lot of the time it was, it was this, and this is like a very classic road and I think I was in Indiana at this point. And there I am, this is a staged photo, but this is exactly what it would look like. I'd be biking down the road and I'd spot some milkweed and I'd kind of start like looking for the signs of caterpillars eating the milkweed. And then I would like, these are like quiet roads. There's not a lot of traffic. I would like pretty much jump off my bike with excitement to go run into the ditch. And in this particular ditch, I probably spent like an hour in this in this ditch looking at all these creatures i started because here's some common milkweed and then if you look really carefully there's a fifth instar caterpillar here and caterpillars go through five molts and this is their their biggest larval stage after their fifth instar stage they'll crawl off the milkweed and their final molt will be into the chrysalis but these guys were the easiest to find and i was getting pretty good at finding them at like 10 miles an hour but I basically by the time I'd gotten to the point where I could like spot a caterpillar at 10 miles an hour like it had been 8,000 miles or so and I was just like my eyes were like tuned and trained to see the world like a monarch would um, and this was spectacular like I got I got to see animals that I, I didn't even know existed before my trip but then at the same same time I saw a lot of this and if you decide to bike 10,000 miles with monarchs you're gonna have a lot of time to think and you're going to spend a lot of the time thinking on a road that looks like this, on a road that you know, just in this case, minutes ago, was habitat for monarchs and is not anymore. And I honestly got 
really angry on my trip. And I, I think that my, my book especially is kind of a, a, is documentation of this, of this, this balance I struck between anger, like just deep, like sorrow and anger and just like be feeling so lost and then, and hope. And it was, it was like literally mile per mile. It depended. Was that, was it this mile where I was like, Woohoo, there's so many monarchs or was it this mile where I was like, <sighs> until every single person knows until every single person has decided that we need to make choices for more than just humans. Like it's, it's, it can be rough and, and it's not just on the roadsides. It's, it's everywhere. If, once you develop eyes to see the world, like a monarch does, like you will see all the habitat that used to be for monarchs and is no longer. And, and the, 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 the people that have made these lawns, like they've done it with the best intentions, right? They wanna be good neighbors. They want, they want to make their yards look nice because that's what we've decided is important. But I think there's this incredible paradigm shift happening and I, I feel it and I see it in the news and I see it in neighborhoods but we're recognizing that we as humans need to be more than good neighbors to, to other humans. We need to be good neighbors to the birds and good neighbors to the, to the butterflies and the bees and the frogs and the snakes. And right now we're not. And until we can learn to share, we're, we, don't, we don't have a chance. And so again, I like feel myself, I'm like getting angry right now and I'm like, ah, but then luckily, like I was saying, there would, there would be these, oh, actually still angry. I'll skip this slide for a second just to say, don't worry, hope ah, hope is coming. Okay, but we're going back. One more thing. Um, this is part of my anger was learning the science. So I spent so much time reading about monarchs, talking to scientists, visiting farms, learning from people that were that were taking care of monarchs in one way or the other. And so like with knowledge, you know, it can, it can be kind of depressing when you start learning the science of all the creatures in the world right now. And, and for the monarchs, this is kind of what they, what it looks like right now. Um, oops. But you don't need to know like all the tiny little numbers and things. In fact, what, what all, what all you really need to know, and a lot of you probably have seen this graph, is that if you look over time, the trend is down. So all populations fluctuate naturally in the wild. That's totally normal. But what's not okay, which is not normal, is this downward trend, because down eventually hits zero. And so what we're what we're looking to do is we're looking to reverse this trend. And so this downward line is in large part due to habitat loss. If you think about it, if there's 500 uh, million monarchs and half of them are female, and each female lays between 300 and 500 eggs. That's a lot of milkweed we need. We need a lot and lot of milkweed because the monarch doesn't lay 500 eggs on one milkweed. If she did that, the caterpillars would decimate that milkweed in minutes. So instead she lays one per plant. And if you look outside, if you go on a walk pretty much anywhere, you'll see, oh, that used to all be milkweed. Oh, there used to be milkweed there, and there's not. So if there's not enough milkweed, there's not enough places for eggs, there's not enough monarchs. So a lot of this trend is just from simply from habitat loss. But what's great about that is we can reverse it. Now, um, because I'm um, speaking in California, I wanted to th do, throw up a, a graph of the overwintering sites in California. And it's obviously you can see to here, not, not, not good. Um, in 2020, the counts were less than 2000. You know, register on this on this graph. Again, there's interesting things happening in California, and a lot of this is because of, in this case, climate change. The temperatures aren't getting low enough to stimulate the monarchs to go into sexual diapause and to spend their time in the trees not breeding. So what we're seeing is that there's these year-round breeding cycles, and so the monarchs no longer are migrating; they're more resident. So we're still seeing monarchs, but the, the phenomenon of them gathering in the trees, that's, that's something that is, is likely gone or, or close to gone. Um, but again, it's like the monarchs are telling us this and, and the monarchs are saying, hey, like we're still here, you can still enjoy us. You can still love, love us and find beauty, but like 
like this isn't this isn't theoretical this is happening and so they are warning us every single day that if we don't change if we don't start to share then this is not going to just happen to the western monarchs but the eastern monarchs as well okay so i've gotten a little angry we've got some some depressing facts for sure but every single person can do something in fact so on my during my presentations i talked to about nine thousand people during my trip and my favorite, favorite part of my entire presentation was at the very end, and I would tell people, I didn't see a monarch every day, but every day I saw someone that could help. And what I love about that is like, literally every single person I saw when I was biking, every single person could help. And for a lot of people, that means planting milkweed. I don't own land. Like I could work with a library or with a school and get a garden started that way. I, I move a lot. So the way that I'm helping is to use my voice. And so I talked to kids this, in this picture, I'm doing my monarch happy dance. That's the dance I do when I see a monarch and you can see some of the kids are like, yeah, let's do this. Um, again, talking to kids is the best. Um, and not, I didn't just talk in classrooms. So I wanna give you guys a little bit of, of some of the hope that I saw while I was biking and, and kind of, you can, you can figure out where, where you fit into this puzzle. Uh, and so one thing is, helping a school plant a garden. This was a school garden in um, Omaha, Nebraska, and probably one of my top five favorite moments of the trip was we were in this garden. We were looking for milkweed, or monarch, excuse me, and a monarch adult flies over our heads. And I don't remember who saw them first, but eventually all 30 kids and I are just like, pretty much screaming. We're just like, ah, this is so amazing. Like, we were thrilled. And that monarch was there because of that milkweed, was there because of that school and the teacher that made that garden happen. And this is such a great example of a garden. Unfortunately, I'm kind of zoomed in, but um, it's like in their parking lot. And it was like this steep, the steep zone that was like really hard to mow. And so the teacher, like, she had to do a lot of negotiating in order for the admin administration to let her do this, but she she started it and now it was like it was a school wide project and all the grades helped and all the grades went out there and these kids are learning about science and stewardship and about taking responsibility and that and the learning that they they can do something because this world is like so full of bad news but to know that you can like go outside today and plant a milkweed and you can be helping that is that is medicine that is so important we and we really need to give that to, to every kid so if you have if you live near a school you might you might consider trying to start a garden there some some other medicine or hope that i had was visiting public land i am a huge proponent of public land and i spent a lot of time with at wildlife refuges they are they're like the not so sexy national or uh, excuse me they're not as sex sexy as national parks but they're so important and they're like these stepping stones for so many migrants not just butterflies but so many birds and bats and all, all and all sorts of animals so supporting our public public land is crucial and then there were farmers maybe you're a farmer it doesn't have to be the system that we have today. And this is not exactly the, a perfect example of how we, what we need to do for food, um, but this is Bill, he's a, a farmer in Texas. Um, he owns Native American seed and he started his career as a landscaper. And he was like, wait, I live in Texas. Why am I planting a plant that needs like water and fertilizer and pesticides and herbicides? This doesn't make any sense. And so he started planting natives. And that turned into Native American seed. And I visited twice because I love this farm so much. It's like so inspiring. I literally saw rows of milkweed that brought, it was just like, it brought tears to my eyes. I was so happy. Um, but he's planting all these native plants and he's working with landowners to grow natives. And then they gather the seeds and they sell them. And wow, I, I, I think about Bill and his family, Native American seed, when, when I'm feeling a little overwhelmed because they're doing it, like everyone's doing something. And then there's the backyard gardens. Um, this is Amy's garden in Tulsa, Oklahoma. One of my favorites, because it's such a good example of sharing, right? I'm not asking people and, the, and folks that are promoting backyard native gardens aren't asking for every single inch to be turned into native lands. Like you can still have some grass, 
for the dog and the kids. You can still have a cement pathway, but you can even still have some ornamental plants. But here in this garden, there's also common milkweed. And this little bit of milkweed, it doesn't seem like much, but what I love is, is that when I got to Amy's house, she said that she'd already found 40 caterpillars on this milkweed. And even if just one of those caterpillars, or excuse me, one of those eggs, she saw 40 eggs. If one of those eggs survives to adulthood, that's 500 more eggs in the next generation. And since it's multi-generational, if a few of that generation survive, that's thousands more eggs by the time they, they get to Canada. And, and what I love is like, there's just like this small crazy chance that like I saw one of the like the great grandmas of an egg or of a, I saw a great grandma monarch that existed only because of, of this, this garden. And like, it really is a team effort. If, if only one person's doing it, it doesn't work. But if everyone has a garden, that adds up. Now I said you, this is a good example of sharing. Here's a great example of going all in. This is one of my favorite gardens too. This is Nadia's garden. And uh, she lives in Columbia, Missouri. And you can like her, her yard is just breathtaking. There was, it was so exciting to explore. And like, I have trained my eyes to see her yard as just incredibly beautiful and just full of diversity and food and all, all sorts of um, important, important things. And then of course her neighbor, I don't see the grass as, as, as beautiful anymore. But what I love about this picture is one, one, Nadia is showing us that like, we don't need to hide our natives in the backyard. We want our, native, our natives to be in the front. We wanna be changing what people think is beautiful. And that's how, what Nadia is doing is she is showing her neighbors and she's showing the people that drive by what we could do, the potential that could be in every single yard. And we need people like Nadia at every street and every neighborhood and every city and every state, all, everywhere. We need people to be showcasing a new, a new way. And then the other thing I love about this picture is that look at there's some milkweed here in the neighbor's yard. And I asked Nadia about it and she said, well, the neighbors used to mow everything. And then they found out that if there's no milkweed, there's no monarchs. So they started mowing around the milkweed. And that, that really just says it all, right? If, if we use our voices and if we share the story of the monarch with our neighbors and our friends and our family, then, then like change is, change is real, change is possible. And, and this milkweed wouldn't exist without, without Nadia being, being a leader. So I love this garden and I'm grateful to everyone that, that has a garden. Um, and it doesn't matter where you live. I saw this monarch in New York City and like, I was running around like a wild person when I saw this monarch. I really wanted a picture. I knew instantaneously, I was like, I need to know that monarch. So all the other tourists are like taking pictures of whatever. And I, I took like, I don't know, I took too many pictures of this, this monarch, but I love it. I love that. I love that this monarch shows us that it does not matter where you live, small town in Kansas, a farm in Texas or New York city. Like if you plant, plants and especially native plants and milkweed, the monarchs will come. It's wonderful. And and not only that, I this is a this is a bit of a tangent, but it's an, an important one. But if you build your garden, if you grow the monarchs or give them the habitat, then you're gonna be part of something big. And and so I I love talking about the monarchs and this this metaphor that they taught me. So bear with me. But you can see this is a picture of the monarchs in Mexico and these clumps are, are monarchs. And there's so many monarchs on the trees you can see in this, in this case, this, this small, smallest tree is literally bending over from the weight of monarchs. It takes about three monarchs equal the weight of a dime. But if you get enough monarchs to, together, they're even known to, to break pretty good sized branches. And so what I, what I love about this is one person, one garden alone doesn't, do a lot, but when all of us are planting gardens, all of us are doing a small part to help the monarchs, we can metaphorically bend branches. And the same goes with our voices, right? When, when the, the sun hits a colony in Mexico, um, in, the, in like the spring in February, March, when it's getting warmer, the, the sun will actually cause all the monarchs to erupt from the branches. And even, you may have even seen this in, in California as well, but what I love is closing my eyes and listening because if there's just one monarch, you're not gonna hear them. 
but if there's a million monarchs or even a, a thousand monarchs flying about, you can start to hear the beat of their wings. And it's this beautiful humming sound. And I, I love it. I've spent four winters in Mexico now. And in the summer, it's like race up the mountain to go, go listen to the monarchs. But just the same metaphor goes, and it, it really inspires me and keeps me going, is, is one butterfly you're not going to hear, but millions together are, are, are a beautiful song. And so my voice alone, you know, it's, it's just me talking right, right now into, into the, the computer void. But if everyone shares the story of the monarch, if everyone gives their voice to a creature on this planet, then we're, we can't be ignored. And I just encourage people to, to take the time to, to share, share what they're learning and get people excited to, to notice nature. And, and I think that's a big part of it, right? Is the monarch is such a, a good teacher to remind us to pay attention. There's this beautiful little, little bright orange butterfly that's, it's really easy to fall in love with and to see how beautiful it is. But what I love is as you start to learn about the monarchs, you wanna learn more and more and more. So you don't just look at them as they're flying by, but you stop and you see, you see the plants they're nectaring on and you start to look for their caterpillars. And you can't be going fast. You can't be driving <laughs> to find a caterpillar. You have to really slow down and you have to notice and you have to pay attention. And as you start to look, this is a little monarch caterpillar eating some milkweed. This is the, what gives the milkweed their name. It's the milky latex sap. It's actually a, a deterrent to most herbivores. Um, it's like a sticky, a sticky latex sap and it's also poisonous, but the, the monarchs can eat the, the milkweed and store that toxin in their bodies. And that's actually what makes monarchs protected by this, this, this milkweed poison. But in order, to, in order to like learn about that, you really have to, to stop and notice. And so you, you, the monarch pulls you into the garden and then you start to notice everything else. You start to notice that like the tussock moths, they also eat only milkweed. Um, I call these guys shag carpet, pretty nice. And you also start to notice all the, the spiders and the ants and the bees and all the other little creatures that not only depend on milkweed, but depend on the monarchs in these, in these interesting ways. So like I was saying earlier, a female monarch might lay between 300 and 500 eggs. Most of those aren't gonna reach adulthood and that's okay. In fact, that's important because they're laying all these little meal packets in nature that eventually will feed the birds that we love and feed the frogs that we love. So it's all important. And, and they're also cute. Look, look at this little spider. How can you not fall in love with a little spider? Again, common milkweed too. And you're gonna start to notice the other pollinators. This is a hummingbird moth I saw in New York. And like the monarch taught me to, to look. And I don't think I would have noticed this, this moth if I hadn't been trained by the monarch. And so it was such a delight. I, I took a lot of photos of this guy as well. And of course, you'll notice the frogs too. This is um, a, little, a little frog that just metamorphosed out of tadpole stage. So it's pretty tiny and he's living in this, this milkweed leaf. And again, like I love frogs. And so, and so I did this whole trip about monarchs and I'm giving my time and my energy and my voice to the monarchs. But in doing so, I'm helping protect frogs. And so if the monarch is not like your passion, that's okay. Like pick, go, go find the bird or the reptile or the frog that, that really speaks to you and go protect them. And in the process, you're gonna protect the monarch and everything is connected. So, so you don't have to bike with the monarchs to help them. In fact, I didn't, I didn't really help them. I, you know, I mean, I gave them my voice, but I, did, I wasn't planting milkweed. Like, everyone has a different role to play. And so you don't have to like quit your job, fly to Mexico or go to Mexico. Um, this, is, this is me in Mexico. I got stabbed by one of these yucca plants on accident and it, my arm hurt for like a month. You don't have to do that. And you also don't have to brave New York City. I am not a city person. Um, I got really lost. I went to the wrong apartment building in New Mexico or in, in New York City. Um, so that's, and that's, that's a story for another day, but you don't have to do that. You don't have to brave the creatures on the road. This, this skunk, I met the skunk in Canada and we had a bit of a misunderstanding, but um, luckily we, we, both, we both made it out alive and luckily I didn't, I didn't get sprayed. Um, you don't have to do that. All you have to do is plant milkweed. 
And I guarantee if you plant milkweed, you're gonna have an adventure and the other adventures will, will come to you. And, and it, it's just so fun. Like, that's what I love about this. I love that I'm asking, I'm asking people to care about nature and be a solution, but it's, it's a fun solution. Like you're gonna make friends and you're gonna have a blast and you're gonna learn so much. So I'm, I'm excited for everyone to, to go out and, and, and be a part of the solution, whatever that looks like. And, and so I'll leave it with, again, my book is Bicycling with Butterflies. My website is beyondabook.org. Um, oh, actually, you know what? I'm going to, I'm not going to leave this up for a second. I'm going to share, I'm going to read, it's a library. I'm going to read um, the last, two paragraphs of, of my book. I think we've got time. Yeah. And um, these, these aren't in the actual, the actual pages of the book. They are, but it's in the acknowledgments. And the acknowledgement section is, is fun because it was really important to me that I listed like everyone I stayed with, every person that helped make a presentation happen because it was important to me to recognize that yes, I was the only one biking, but my trip was only possible because of millions of monarchs and because of thousands of people that, that helped me out. And my, my first draft of my acknowledgements was like, like a normal acknowledgements is like what, like two pages? Mine was like 15 and <laughs> the publisher was like, yeah, no, that's, that's not gonna work. So I cut it down into like seven pages or so and I'm, I'm gonna read the last two paragraphs. Thanks to everyone fighting in endlessly big and small ways on behalf of the monarchs and their neighbors. Our paths may not have crossed, but your efforts are seen, felt and appreciated. Biking past an unmowed ditch or a lawn devoted to natives will always make me hoot with joy. And finally, with all my heart and soul, thanks to the monarchs, you amaze me. You have become my teachers, encouraging an adventure, teaching me Spanish, watercolor, web design, video editing, photography, networking, public speaking, gardening, stewardship, science, and love. You helped me write this book and every word of it is for you. So I would not have written this book without the monarchs. I wouldn't be here tonight without the monarchs. I'm, I'm so grateful and I'm, Excited to answer any questions folks have. So I will stop sharing here and see where things take us. Yes, no, thank you, Sarah. Wonderful, a lot of praise in the chat for you in your, your wonderful presentation. Um, and there's a lot of questions all over the place. So we're, we're okay. so we can get some here. Um, so let's get to the top here. Um, so earlier you had said uh, there were Eastern and Western groups. Um, mm -hmm. and they're not genetically different. Um, right. is, is there any way to know if a monarch switches communities or is it possible that that happens and can you tell? So there's there's a lot of tagging efforts happening. So there's so people will actually tag monarchs to track where they go. And there are these little stickers that go on their wings. Um, most of the tagging is done in, in the east because there's way more monarchs and those tags are then recovered mostly in, in Mexico, mostly through the organization Monarch Watch, but there are efforts to tag Western monarchs and, and there has been some overlap, but a lot of it's still unknown, right? Because if you tag a monarch in Mexico, the chances of someone finding that monarch in California are, are so, so slim, most of the monarchs won't get captured. So there's still a lot of unknowns, but just simply looking at genetics lets us know that there is overlap somehow. Um, so it's it's probably likely in the winter, that's that's probably when the, the change is happening, but it's again, so much is still unknown, which is amazing. Like the monarch is probably one of the most studied insects maybe ever. And yet there's just so many questions. So, so much still to be to be learned and discovered. Sweet. Um, also, a side question on like, what does the tagging process look like for the monarchs typically? People will, so most of the, the monarchs are tagged in the fall um, for to, to track where, where their, their, their migration. And it's, it's really, you catch a monarch and you put a sticker on their wing. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. I've, I've only tagged one. Again, I, I move a lot, but I, I was lucky to tag one in and um, yeah, there's a whole a whole database, and a lot of information's come out of 
from the from the it's mostly monarch watch like i said monarch watch tagging program and people are in especially out on the east east are encouraged to tag wild monarchs and see where they go sweet um a few questions come up uh, about milkweed um so one can milkweed be dug up and replanted I've I've heard some success with that, but I think the easier answer is not really. So many natives have these just have these intricate root systems, and that's why we don't need to water them all summer. Um, so often it's just it's not it's not it doesn't work. It's a lot easier you to either go with seeds, um, and there's lots of different ways to do it. Milkweed is interesting because it has to be cold stratified, which means the seeds have to undergo a period of of winter so a lot of a lot of times and this is how i've always um germinated milkweed is before spring hits i'll put them in between a damp paper towel and then i'll put them in a plastic bag in the refrigerator and then they'll go through about a about six weeks of of cold in the fridge and then you can take them out and germinate them in the spring you can also right now is a great time to just buy seeds and sprinkle them in a open area of the garden They'll spend all winter outside. They'll get cold stratified that way, and then grow. And then again, also just finding finding um, native plant sales. If you type in native plant sale, something's bound to come up. And and it's it's important when you're thinking about what milkweed to buy to make sure that it's organic and native. Organic because if a caterpillar is obviously if a caterpillar is eating pesticides, it's it's not going to make it. And then native native is just always if you have an option, always go the native route. Um, that's that's the plant that's supposed to be there. Thousands and thousands of years of trial and error have made that plant better for that spot and have made that plant the plant that the monarchs want. Um, a question, so we got tons of milkweed questions. <laughs> uh, is there any sources that you recommend in, in determining species of milkweed or if it's what's good to grow in your geographical? area in terms of their as a website or a resource that you can recommend there's a like a milkweed finder i think through the xerces society that will get you not only the native species in your area but also nurseries that that might have those species um, and then the other thing that i like to do is just i tell folks just plant a few species and see which one survives so like here i'm in, in nevada county up up the uh, in the foothills of the Sierra right now, and I planted three species of milkweed in the in the spring, and one of them survived of the three. It was a a, hot, a really hot, pretty terrible um, summer, but now I'm like, okay, that's that's the one that wants to wants to live there. Um, so it's a little bit of trial and error, and there like it's not the the natives want to grow. So what I recommend folks is try a few different species, water them the first year, give them a, a little bit of a, of a, a kind of a, a, a nudge, an encouraging nudge. And then also remember that I just learned, I just heard this phrase that natives, they sleep, they creep, and then they leap. So the first year, you're not gonna see a whole lot of growth. Be patient, the same with the second year, but the, by the third year, they'll be well-established and you'll really start to see them take off. Sweet. Um, there's a question about uh, the monarch's wings. Um, are the veins on monarch wings as individually distinct as fingerprints? I want to say no. I don't think so. Um, that's a good question, but I, I, I don't think so. Okay. I think it's a little bit more like bones. Like it's there. It's just I'm sure there are, there are some distinctions. The and there's kind of two veins we're talking about. There's like the veins that make up like the structure of their wing, and then there's like the the black patterning um, that is made up more of the the scales that have color. So, but again, I, I think it's it's like most it's more it's more anatomy, and then the the scales the pattern with the scales it changes based on sex. So females tend to have thicker black like quote veins and then um also like sometimes there's a little bit of different different differences in color and then of course as they get older they start to lose the scales and they start to like get um faded so you'll start to see differences but that's more based on just 
condition than anything else. If someone knows, if someone's like, no, that is not true, you put it in the chat. I'm I'm not afraid to to learn something new, <laughs> but I don't think so. Gotcha. There's backing up a question um, about tagging. Um, does the butterfly, so touching a butterfly wing causes its protective wing dust to rub off? Is that, yeah. if it's, it's just like when you're tagging, does that affect any of that? Right. Yeah, that wing dust is their scales. The scales are what reflect the color and give butterflies not just their color, but also helps with thermal regulation. Um, so, right, you don't want to, you don't want to like be touching monarchs a whole lot. But I will say, like when I was in Texas in the spring, the the monarchs I was seeing in Texas in the spring, they were born in the northern bit part of the United States and southern Canada. They flew all the way to Mexico. They overwintered all winter, and then they flew all the way back to Texas. And I was seeing monarchs that had like 50% of their wings left, and and were just like a very faded orange. Like if you didn't know, you might not even think they were monarchs. So these monarchs can fly with less scales. It's obviously not, we don't wanna be like taking them off on purpose. The other thing is we know that the tagging is not super detrimental because we recover monarchs in Mexico. So if, if it was like making it impossible for them to migrate, we wouldn't find them in Mexico. On that same token though, I think it's so important to think about these things and to ask, be constantly asking ourselves these questions. And then to maybe like not tag every single monarch that there is because because of this, but at, at the amount of monarchs that are tagged is pretty small compared to the whole population and we, we know that it, it doesn't cause terrible side effects, but but a very good question. Um, there was a question about the journey here. Uh, I bet you probably get this one a lot, but how many flat tires did you encounter? I think on this trip, I think I wrote it down. Four flats was my. Hey. I only had four flats. I I buy I buy um pretty good tires and they last. They usually last about fifteen thousand miles or so. I know it's time to replace them when I'm getting a flat like every month or every week or even every day. But yeah, I had good luck with the with my with the flats. And then during your journey, and you see, I see that you have uh, class visits and you know in, invites. Uh, were you social media? Was that one way that you were chronicling your journey and people can reach out, or how were people learning about where you were at a certain time, a given time? Right. I so I I kept up my my blog at beyondbook.org and then tried to. I was mostly on Facebook, and then it was just a lot of word of mouth like a lot and the, sometimes it's like you don't even know where it was or how it happened but all of a sudden you'd be like staying with a friend of a friend of a friend and you're like I don't really know how I got here but I'm, I'm really happy I'm here so I'm gonna go with it and then I also sent out lots of press releases again to try and be a voice it was like get get in the media like make some noise and so I would often send a press release to to a newspaper and sometimes that would you know, then that would bring people to my website and then they'd send me an email that says, hey, please come here or, or whatnot. Okay. The monarchs really do connect us all. It's really, it's kind of amazing. Like ever, everyone's connected by monarchs in some way or another. So got a few more questions rolling in here, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so uh, this one here, how would you know if you were not on their migration path? How would I know if they, if I wasn't? Yeah. I guess, well, so the the wonderful thing about the monarch as far as their path is that, well, it's it varies year to year, but because there's millions, I mean, often billions, then you're, you're bound, if, as long as you're like in Texas in the spring, you're bound to cross paths with the monarch. There were definitely days where I wouldn't see a monarch, not a whole, I think I saw on average, like about two and a half a day, I think was the calculus. But that was often because it was maybe like, a, a cold spell um, or because it was like pure corn and there was just no habitat at all but I I think that like if I had stayed in one spot I would have eventually seen a monarch as long as I was in, in their in their range which was kind of a wonderful invitation right most animals don't give you that level of flexibility um got a question here uh, earlier you mentioned the little side note about Florida um, mm. 
<laughs> people are curious about the side note. <laughs> well, there, if you look on that map, you'll notice there's a question mark and it's all still kind of up in the air. But one thing that we think happens is that the monarchs typically fly north and then the prevailing winds push them east. And so the, that's why you start, you get monarchs colonizing the east later in the year. And then when fall happens, most of them are gonna fly in this directional path back to, to Mexico. Some of them get, get go down the coast. And some of them that go down the coast end up in Florida. And it doesn't really, they don't have the like sense to go back north and then keep going. And they're not crossing the Gulf, at least not that often and not documented that often. So they kind of just get funneled there and they stick. And so some winters in Cal Air in Florida, it doesn't get too cold and they can survive, or at least a few of them might be able to survive in a microclimate. Often though, a cold snap will, will hit Florida for even just a couple days and that'll be enough to, to kill all those monarchs. Um, but it's changing as climate change is warming up the planet. There it's, it's looking like there's more evidence that maybe it's more likely that they're going to be um, surviving in Florida. And then that opens up this whole other pan, can of worms because, because of, of um, parasites and all, all sorts of other things where it's like, man, the balance was just so perfect. And as we kind of just change things around even subtly, the effects of that are just still beginning to reveal themselves. But I, I did a bike tour after this trip so my trip was in 2017 and in 2019, I led a bike tour across the country. And we started in California and Texas, I saw like 10,000, I calculated about 10,000 monarchs in like two days, which was way more than I saw on my entire trip. And I was like, come on, you couldn't have done this when I was biking with you. But I saw a lot of monarchs in Texas, it was phenomenal. And then when I got to Florida, I saw hundreds, hundreds of monarchs, but it was early, it was early winter. so. That cold snap hadn't happened yet. Sweet. So, was this bike tour with? Were you still solo riding, or were you inviting people to this one? <laughs> this was um, an organized trip through Adventure Cycling Association, and it, they're an amazing trip out of or amazing organization, a nonprofit out of Missoula, Montana. They do incredible advocacy work. They have an awesome publication. I, I, anyone that is interested in bike touring, I would recommend um, joining them. I see a couple of questions here, um, but I want to ask questions here too. Um, biking 10,000 miles, riding about biking 10,000 miles. Which one was, which one's easier? <laughs> uh, bicycling is so much easier than riding. <laughs> oh, sometimes I would like be, I'd like, you know, call my parents or my friends and I'd be like, I made it to Texas in my book. <laughs> But it's taken me longer to get from Mexico to Texas riding than it did riding. There's a there's a joke in there with riding and riding, but I haven't figured it out quite. But yeah, Sorry. I didn't lose power. <laughs> Is conserving energy here? Um, let's see here. Just go through the the, the questions here. Um, shout out to the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. They could also advise on the best type of milkweeds uh, for our area, um, sell plants right. as well. Um, there was a question here. Why did you want to follow the monarch butterflies? Why did you choose this trip? I guess was the spark? Was there a day you just woke up like this is what I'm doing or is it planned? I did a bike tour from Bolivia to Texas in 2013. And we, I was with a friend and we were in Mexico and we were like, let's go see the monarchs. But it was like, it was like April 1st. And they, the monarchs live at about 10,000 feet above sea level in Mexico. And we were like, man, we are tired of biking. We do not want to bike 10,000 feet uphill only to find that they've already left because they usually leave in March, even February at this point. So I like, just like was like, I'll come back one day and I'll, and I'll, and I'll see that. And that just kind of sat with me for a few years. And then on my other trips, I would visit schools as well. And I just kept, it just kept like everything pointed in that one direction. It was like, oh, teachers are already learning, teaching science and teaching curriculum through, through the lens of monarchs. 
Like they're already in classrooms. There's, there's this so much opportunity. Like I was saying, like their route is not constricted. And, and like, when you want to protect, like say a, a frog, they're way more sensitive. They're not living in everyone's backyard. Or if you want to protect the polar bear, right? Like the, it's a lot more, it's a bigger existential problem or challenge, I guess you could say for these other animals, but for the monarch, the challenge is existential, but at the same time, it's also like very individual and like there's something so powerful about being able to help today because it's so easy to get lost in the bad news and to get bogged down and feel helpless. And so here's this creature that's like, actually, all you have to do is go plant some plants. And you're like, okay, I can do that. Like, it's like, okay, like this is possible. And so I, I think that that's such a gift the monarch gives us. And I think we should all take advantage of it because it's, it's, it's healing to help. It's healing to, to do something. That's great. Oh, I, I see a question. I, I someone shouted out Brianda. Um, I talk about Brianda in in my book. She, um, we talk a lot. She's doing well. Like I was pretty scared of COVID. I was in I was in Mexico up until March twenty third of twenty twenty, um, and I was getting worried. And they were like a few months behind us as far as like recognizing the gravity of the situation. So I was really nervous, but like, yes, a lot of people have died, mostly mostly older people near El Rosario, but um, for the most part, they're weathering the storm. Uh, a, a bigger issue, of course, is tourism. Like, there wasn't much of a tourist season. That means there's less jobs. That means there's less opportunity for people. And so that, of course, is stressful. We got a question about uh, how many miles would you bike in a day on average through your journey? Yeah, I tried to shoot for about 60 miles a day. That varied because definitely because of, the, of my presentations, like sometimes it was like, oh boy, I got to get somewhere quick. Or often like I did carry, this was my first trip with a smartphone. And so I would like spend a lot of time looking at weather um, and at wind patterns. So I might have like a 200 mile stretch and I'd look and be like, okay, tomorrow's the day that I'm gonna have the tailwind. So I'd wake up and I'd bike a hundred miles that day oh, no. so that the next day with the headwinds, I could kind of, I could relax a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I tried to go about 60 a day with a, with a usually a rest day once a week. And you said you only carried one day's worth of food. Was there any time where you were just, it was cutting close there? or you were always pretty good <laughs> i i'm pretty good uh i i guessing in in mexico i care like there were some stretches that were a little bit longer um i don't i didn't yeah there's almost always something or it might be like what would happen would be like okay like decent vegetables aren't going to be for the next three days so i might buy more of that but know that i could buy like crackers or whatever peanut butter pretty much anywhere so it was a lot of like kind of looking ahead a little bit and I often probably had more food than I needed, but it was nice to not have to stress. Yeah, we're using a lot of energy biking as a person who yeah. doesn't bike. I don't know. <laughs> Just throwing these out there. <laughs> no, people think that you, it's like, so I've done a lot of like other types of travel. Biking is the most efficient form of tra transportation. It's, it's so like, 50 miles biking, I think is like the caloric equivalent of like 12 miles walking. So like I, when I, I hiked the Continental Divide Trail many years ago now, but I was, I was walking about 25 miles a day and that is way harder. Like that's probably like doing 110, 120 miles a day on a bike. But because I had all day, like I was only going about 10 miles an hour. And like, if you start in the morning and you go all day, like you have, a lot of time to go slow and to take breaks and your body's used to it so like a few times like in Mexico like with some really steep mountain that that was like I, at the end of the day I was like toast but for the most part I could kind of just like it felt just like kind of baseline like I wasn't pushing myself too hard I would say more of the hard part is mental right is like packing up your tent every day like 
being in your head, being alone, like, man, sometimes you're just like, I don't want to think. Sometimes it was like, I better put in a podcast or I'm going to think too much. <laughs> so I think, I think the harder part is, is the mental, the mental challenge. And while you're on your journey, were you aware that you were going to be writing a book at the same time? Or was it towards a certain point where like, you know what, it's, I should be writing some stuff down right now. I, for all of the trips I've ever done, I keep a journal, which has been just part of, part of things. Um, and I try to write a blog and I always enjoyed doing that, but I didn't have any intention really to write a book until about halfway through where I just like realized that I had a lot of opinions and I had a lot to say. Like one thing that happened just every single day was like an older person would come up to me and say like, when I was a kid, there used to be lots of monarchs and like every single day. And I just wanted to like address that. I wanted to address like, okay, so the generation before got to see lots of monarchs and now there's less and there's a chance that the next generation will see even less. And so unless you are doing something to help then you're part of the problem and like it was important for me to like get that onto a page and to like give people not only the tools to be part of the solution but to remind them that it's their responsibility and it was it was definitely therapy to write the book <laughs> and it yeah it if it, it was it was hard and it was I felt good about having to articulate all these feelings that were developing in my head for hun hundreds of hours thousands of hours of <laughs> thinking time let's say a lot of a lot of time with your thoughts <laughs> yeah. too much too much <laughs> um which goes that gets me to the this final question we have here was what is next sarah well i'm actually trying speaking of how hard it is to write a book i my target audience when i was doing my presentations was fifth graders. I, I love talking to eight to 12 year olds, especially. So I'm really, I'm trying to write this, trying to write a story of my monarch trip for that, that age. I'm like so excited to tell them about like things about like, it's okay to be angry and it's okay to like be a little scared for the world, but also like we all have it in us to, to change the world. So that's, that's what I'm working on now. And, and then longer term is I, I want to be a voice for the frogs so I would love to do a I'm, I'm like thinking like amphibious trip like I want to do something that's half land half water and speak for the frogs so that would be that'd, we'll see that'd be cool we would love to have you back <laughs> awesome well um, thank you